This video is brought to you by viewers like you. Thanks for helping me afford toilet paper. Every once in a while, I'll ask people, hey, you remember Avatar? And they always come back with, do you mean the blue one or the good one? And I think that's the best way to describe this mutant freak show of a franchise. With its own theme park and the sequels that seem to only exist in news articles discussing how they just got delayed again, on top of, at the time, making a record-setting amount of money and seemingly being so good that it caused Twilight moms to spiral into their own kind of depression, it's a bizarre beast to try and wrap your head around. If you're one of the three people on the entire planet that hasn't seen it, it's basically Pocahontas, but blue. Or you could look at it like Dances with Wolves, but blue. It's actually remarkably similar to Fern Gully, but blue. And I think thematically, it's a lot like the Lorax, but blue. With a budget of $237 million and the titanic dream team of James Cameron and John Landau, along with composer James Horner again, that you know not only from Titanic, but from all these other films that everybody's seen, it's really no question how this film became so amazingly successful. Except that it wasn't. The soundtrack isn't honestly that bad, until you know what it is that you're listening to, even though it might be my favorite work from James Horner in a spiritual sense. This one's kind of hard to explain. Have you ever wondered why this film had such a massive budget? I'm pretty sure a lot of it went into the super whiz-bang motion capture stuff, which back in 09 would have been pretty expensive, but I'm convinced that not an insignificant amount of the budget went toward WORLD BUILDING! Avatar has some of the deepest lore that you've never heard of before. It honestly starts feeling more like Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones as soon as you start looking into it. There's a whole book dedicated to explaining the Na'vi world, and of course, I bought it. And in turn, fans have compiled all of this expanded Na'vi lore into their own wiki. It has the entire history of the RDA, that evil corporation that tries to take over Pandora. It explains the superconductivity of Unobtainium, along with not one, but two fictitious schools of thought that try to explain how the Unobtainium led to the formation of the Hallelujah Mountains. Every single plant you see in this film gets its own little section complete with a made-up binomial nomenclature. It explains the culture of the Na'vi, including how the population that we see in Avatar is the Omatakaya, named after the Omatis Ampa, or the Blue Flute. Omatakaya literally translating to the clan of the Blue Flute, which, of course, doesn't show up in the film, and they make sure to make a note of that in the book. Okay, but if neither humans nor avatars have ever seen the flute, then how do we know what it looks like? Checkmate, atheists! And guys, don't worry, for every mistake I make in this video, the xenomusicologists that they hired totally have it covered. It also highlights how the Omatakaya are known for their weaving and their textiles, because remember that from the movie? All those scenes where Jake learns how to weave? At first, you just kind of want to dismiss the book like it was some rogue English major that was so insanely happy to get a writing gig that they invented their own headcanon about how blue cat people get married and carry babies. But before we get there, I'd like to draw your attention to the Navi language that we hear throughout the film. This isn't some Cub Scout cipher where you just swap out an English word for a made-up one. This is an entirely developed conlang, or made-up language, complete with its own grammatical structures, all created by Dr. Paul Frommer, a linguist at USC, who they hired specifically to create this language. Navi is as much a language as Klingon and Elvish, and it's filled with all kinds of interesting non-English sounds like these ejectives and fricatives and glottal stops. <laughs> They hired Carla Mayer, a dialect coach, to help the actors handle all of these non-English sounds. In fact, CCH Pounder, who plays Moat, managed to handle it fantastically. Forget to Wong T, well, Steve. Oh. What are you called? Hear how she says the K in Jake Sully? Learn well. Jake Sully. That's the accent. That's those non-English sounds. That's that ejective consonant, which is the complete polar opposite of Sam Worthington just doing everything he can to try and not sound Australian. The enemy is out there, and they are very powerful. Sometimes your whole life boils down to one insane move. But back to the pre-production. Okay, so they hired Dr. Jody S. Holt, a plant physiology professor at the University of California, Riverside, to make sure that all the plant science they did in the film was as accurate as possible, down to how the actors were going to take samples. It's difficult to overstate the absolutely astronomical amount of work that went into the world of Avatar. Literally, as far as I can tell, they actually modeled the Pandoran solar system to get the day-night cycles accurate and have the planets in the background appear as they should within the Avatar world. This this was the most extra film ever. 
To me, that's why they went ahead and put in Avatar Land at Disney World, and they keep pushing to make those sequels. They've already done a Star Trek amount of world building, developing that deep lore, and they want to make more of a profit off of their investment. And with all of those pre-production costs and development, we have my new favorite human being. When not posting pictures of the cakes she decorates on her website, Dr. Wanda Bryant is an extremely accomplished ethnomusicologist. Ethnomusicology is the study of music as it pertains to culture, especially outside the Western European tradition. And when James Horner was hired by James Cameron, and they got the old Titanic duo back together, Horner turned to Dr. Bryant to help him develop a new kind of music for the Na'vi. And Bryant, being an absolute badass, wrote up her entire experience with working on the music for the film in an essay that I'll link down in the description because I'm just not going to be able to cover all of it here. And I cannot urge you enough to go and read it for yourself because it almost reads like a crime scene investigation. But we'll get to that. And there's also this really great interview with Bryant where she talks about the whole experience on My Outer Space's YouTube channel. I'll link it in the description below. So again, just to reinforce the idea of how in-depth the pre-production was, by the time they had started consulting with Dr. Bryant, they had already had this idea that the Navi would have drum circles where each drum would represent a different planet in the Pandoran solar system and they'd play, and I quote, in a complex rhythmic structure which features multi-layered elliptical time signatures derived from the orbital patterns of their solar system. Which, I don't even know where to start with that. Are the Na'vi supposed to be Ligeti fans or something? Were they trying to do like a Musica Universalis but for Pandora? It was intense. And immediately, Bryant noticed some pretty considerable problems. Like, one, what on earth? Nah pun intended, is an elliptical time signature. And two, in her own words, she says, I realize that there is a disconnect between the artistic concept and the ethnomusicological or organological perspective. For example, that Omatis Ampa, the blue flute that this Navi nation is named after, isn't actually a flute. It's a trumpet. So there's that. Organology is a really important field to study when you want to make up an instrument, kids. Then she noticed that while the avatars have five fingers, the Navi only have four, meaning that if they were going to have some kind of aerophone or wind instrument like a flute, then they'd only really have access to a pentatonic scale instead of our heptatonic one. They would only have five notes per octave instead of the seven that you see in the Western European tradition, which, strangely enough, created a big problem for Horner. See, the idea with Avatar was that they wanted to take cultures from all over the planet, kind of throw them into an artistic blender and then create a culture that wasn't completely recognizable as one specific population or society on earth. They wanted something vaguely non-white that wouldn't single out any one group of people. So they committed to blue cat people. Think of it like the animals. Clearly this is a rhinoceros, but it has this head like a hammerhead shark and this peacock feather thing on its head, but it's still obviously supposed to be a rhino or a rhino stand in. Or like the horses, they have this anteater thing going on and they have scales and these like gill sort of things or whatever, but they're still very clearly horses. That's basically what they were trying to do culturally for the Na'vi. Now, when he heard that the Na'vi would only have access to a pentatonic scale, Horner got a little nervous that it might sound a little too recognizable as Asian or African or Native American. He wanted a completely new sound. At the same time, Cameron made it apparent that he was a very hands-on director, wanting to be invested in every aspect of the music production. So when Bryant ended up getting too focused on the musical logic of the concept art, Cameron admitted that, and I quote, on occasion, a detail or two may have been overlooked or consciously ignored in the interest of storytelling. Which, hold up. Okay, so you're saying that you can break the canon in order to maintain effective storytelling. Okay, cool. Very cool. But that's even though you're spending millions of dollars in pre-production to develop this alien world. Which you might then end up ignoring in order to better develop the story that you haven't written yet? What? Let's just call that a red flag and move on from now. Okay, so back to the music. So Horner was a super tough customer for Bryant. As Bryant puts it, Horner was extremely well versed in all kinds of world music. So Bryant had to really dig deep to find pieces of music and sounds that Horner hadn't heard before. In the end, she had 25 examples of music that her and Horner agreed would be workable. Here are a few that she listed. Swedish cattle herding calls, folk dance songs from the Naga people of Northeast India, Vietnamese and Chinese traditional work songs, greeting songs from Burundi, Celtic and Norwegian medieval lament, Central African vocal polyphony, Persian Tahrir, microtonal works by Chelsea, the Finnish women's group Vartina, personal songs from the Central Arctic Inuit, and brush dances from Northern California. 
On top of that, she hired singers from Bulgarian, Israeli, Indian, and North African vocal traditions, and at one point hired instrumentalist Tony Hinnigan, who plays various panpipes, whistles, ocarinas, and the kenna, among all kinds of other non-Western instruments. If I hadn't made my point yet, this is most likely where all the money went for the film, at least in terms of the music budget. And they went absolutely ham, writing demo after demo after demo. They did everything they could to blend these completely different styles together, which would have been extraordinarily difficult considering how they all came from different language backgrounds, with different vocal inflections and phonemes on top of massively different tuning systems. Not every culture dealt with a Pythagorean comma with equal temperament like Western Europe. If you want more information, there's a great write-up on Not Another Music History Cliches blog, as well as a great video by 12 Tone. Links in the description for both. And all of that doesn't even begin to address the different rhythmic systems that you find in this collection. Think about how hard it is to get any three people on Twitter to agree about anything. Now multiply that by tuning system math, and you have a whole different kind of nightmare. Honestly, what they came up with sounds really cool on paper, and it sounds like like at every point they were respecting all of the concept art and lore that they had already developed for this world. Like some of these microtonal drones that they would have to represent Awa and the natural world for one of the songs. It was really fascinating to read about. So when Cameron came to them saying that he wanted a bunch of different songs to relate to different aspects of Navi life, that was actually also pretty cool to read about too. Especially when he mentions that he didn't want the songs to be like a performance, he wanted it to be more about their daily life. Which again is an interesting and non-Western perspective for a director to have, which is pretty exciting to hear on a project like this. He wanted like a weaving song, a hunting song, a funeral lament, and like a spiral song for Awa or something like that. And if you're at all curious, yes, the lyrics for those songs did make it in the book. Which is absolutely fantastic until you read about what ended up happening. Initially, Cameron wrote the lyrics for these songs in English, which when translated into the Navi language with very non-English sounds, became kind of difficult to sing, and he started changing the lyrics to have it sound better to his Western ears. Again, different languages with different phonemes have different ways of making their language sound good when sung. That's why accurately studying this stuff is so important. To reiterate, this is really basic stuff. If you want your song sung in the native language using these new sounds, the songs are just going to end up sounding a little different than what you're used to. You might even say that to you, these songs would sound alien. <laughs> On top of that, when Horner and Bryant had started putting the individual songs together, taking inspirations from all over the place, they ran into the problem of merging the non-Western sounds with the Western orchestra that was going to fill the gaps in the score. After all of this was said and done, this was still going to be your standard blockbuster movie with your standard blockbuster movie soundtrack. The disparate non-Western musical systems led to them using a microtonal system that would significantly contrast with the Western orchestra that they would play for the rest of the film. But to be clear, they set out to create music that sounded like nothing anyone had ever heard before. The problem was that that's exactly what they did, and they went out and wrote music that sounded like nothing anyone had ever heard before, which in turn led to Cameron shooting down every single one of their demos because they didn't sound right to him, probably because they had made music that no one had ever heard before. Which again, to me, sounds like exactly what you want to have happen when you're writing about a culture that is literally alien. Again, millions of dollars in pre-production and research, but eh, it just doesn't sound quite right. How about next time, instead of wasting all these resources, you just toss a bunch of instruments into a wood chipper and save everybody some time? To be fair, Bryant paints Cameron as someone who is aware of the difficulties that they had to face, but it doesn't make any sense that he would shut them down that hard. It's like, this is exactly what you paid for. What did you expect? So in the end of this entire ordeal, only one song made it into the film, The Lament at the Tree of Souls. <laughs> Cameron said that he wanted to break with Navi tradition. Remember, this is a tradition that they're making up, and he wanted them to write a Navi Amazing Grace, something that could be understood by all from Oklahoma to South Dakota. That is a direct quote. And when they even just tried to ornament the vocal lines in that song to make it sound even slightly less Western or even European, Cameron shot it down again and again. At this point, everything almost completely fell apart for the duo. Bryant specifically says, The Navi Amazing Grace episode forced us to realize that our dreams of creating a truly unique and unusual musical sound for the Navi would be tempered by the fact that this was not our movie. In the end, and I'm leaving a lot out here, they basically had to abandon almost all their work. In the film, when you hear some kind of vocal line, if it's in Navi, it's a nonsense lyric that has no meaning. <laughs> The syllables that Horner picked were so they could cut through the orchestra, not necessarily because they meant anything. They could literally be singing about what they had for lunch, it wouldn't make a difference. The only microtonality, or at least non-Western tonality, that you hear in the film comes at the end of phrases where the pitch falls off.
Horner ended up having the same problem with the live instruments that he had with the songs, and he ended up just sampling them so he could just treat all the non-Western instruments like his traditional Western instruments. All the drums were completely digital, with multiple drum sounds being layered on top of one another until it sounded just right. Which is why, when you listen to it, the score sounds incredibly digital. Come. Which to me makes these scenes feel so much more artificial and computer generated. At every single point, Horner and Bryant did their best, got shut down, and then they had to construct some kind of artificial replacement that sounded vaguely like the original. Boy oh boy, making something that'll walk, talk, and act like it's from the native culture, but isn't, why does that sound familiar? Bryant mentions that there are in fact some fragments of their work in the film, like how the film opens with a call that is vaguely reminiscent of one of the Swedish cattle herding calls that she had shown Horner at the very beginning, but aside from that and the lament of the Tree of Souls, Bryant really makes it seem like very little of the original work made it into the film outside of vague timbral colorings here and there. Um, so far in my research I've found five places where I can identify very clearly, here was the sound source that I brought to James Horner, and here's something very similar. Not the same. Mm. You can hear Horner's creativity in it, but the concept or the sound quality, something that is there that's very recognizable. When talking about the overall effect of the score, she cites Marvin Cook's A History of Film Music. Cook could have been writing about Avatar's score when he discussed the pervasive use of ethnic instruments and voices, sometimes lending authenticity to a film's cultural or geographical milieu, but at times perpetuating a generalized timbral exoticism that suggested Hollywood stereotyping was still a guiding spirit. That is Avatar's score in a nutshell. In other words, this score is kind of like if you like took something from a group of people without really asking for it and then repurposed it beyond recognition in order to make money. It's kind of like that. It's difficult to um, visualize something like that happening, but it's kind of like the musical equivalent of that. Horner and Bryant set out to try and make this soundtrack sound like this beautiful collage of music from all over the planet, but in the end, it was specifically engineered to be as inoffensive as possible while sounding vaguely non-Western. Let me see if I can get this straight for you. A guy spearheading a project sponsored by a massive corporation decides, either directly or indirectly, to hire a doctor who specializes in a field where their work might help legitimize the project's intentions, but at every opportunity, for the sake of profit and easy accessibility, this guy undermines the doctor and her work such that she is effectively forced out of the project and is only able to comment on the legitimacy of their actions from afar. Now, where have I heard that story before? And it's not like it isn't obvious. When you go through the film with a fine tooth comb, it's kind of a disaster. Like, let's pretend that in the end, they decided to use certain instruments and textures to represent different populations. <laughs> Okay, fine, it sounds vaguely non-Western, we'll call that the Na'vi sound. Well then why do the humans get these vocal lines when they approach Home Tree, and Jake and the Na'vi get this brass moment during the final confrontation? We even hear brass when Jake shows up on that pterodactyl. In fact, when the animals come to save the day, it almost sounds like Superman showing up. You might argue that Horner was one step ahead of the game and was trying to make the blue flute that doesn't appear in the film and is actually a trumpet up here in the actual film by playing all this brass, but that is some 4D chess that no one's gonna get because there's literally nothing that sounds more European than brass. And sure, there's this really cool nature motif that comes back over and over again. Jeez. Sorry. Watch it. <laughs> yeah, check it out. Oh, crap. And there's this really cool moment where they're breaking out of jail, and again when the colonel shoots Grace, where we get this DS eerie like melody. Judy, fire up the ship. Go. Here. The problem is that both that nature motif and this Dias Eerie moment appear in the love ballad that they marketed with the film, 
Which you can just tell that they desperately wanted this to be a new My Heart Will Go On. Which, when you look at it that way, means that this moment is actually a reference to the love ballad, or the love ballad has a reference to the medieval chant of death. Take your pick. Either way, it's weird. To be completely fair, though, there's one thing I actually like about the soundtrack, and it's the motif for Home Tree. When Jake first sees Home Tree, he's a prisoner. It's nighttime, and it's really scary. But when he wakes up there, it's daytime, the motif is less ominous, and that's really cool. We also get it when Jake wakes up from the ashes of Home Tree and goes to help the Navi, again, because it's all thematically about Home Tree. <laughs> It also plays when the colonel is shooting Grace. Grab my hand! Come on, in, let's go! And when Rogue One, yes, her call sign is Rogue One. Rogue One, you copy. Starts fighting against the gunships, maybe because they're both fighting for Home Tree and the Navi, I don't know. Oops. Which, again, cool. But in the grand scheme of things, that is one thing that Horner was able to sneak in there underneath the three hour mountain of scathing imitation. When you look at this film as a whole, with all the work that went into creating, at the time, the most successful film in history, the story behind the music is nothing short of depressing. On one hand, Horner's efforts were commendable. He never had to reach out to an ethnomusicologist, nor did he have to put in all of that effort to try and create this familiar but artificial musical landscape. But he did it anyway, and I would absolutely kill to hear those demos. But if your whole film is basically a blue version of Pocahontas, Dances with Wolves, Fern Gully, and the Lorax, it might do you a little good to, I don't know, maybe actually sit down with one of those stories and really think about what it's trying to say. Because the score in this film is the musical equivalent of strip mining. Yeah, it made a lot of money, but it came at a cost. We are all worse off for not having a score that could have had all those different types of world music coming together. At every twist and turn, they mutated the non-Western music that they'd collected to fit in with a Western audience. There's virtually nothing about this score that isn't just some permutation of traditional Western European music. This stood to be one of the most amazing and awe-inspiring Hollywood scores ever, on top of being James Horner's magnum opus, but they just undermined the duo's efforts over and over again. I can't stress this enough, everything about this film was artificially engineered to satisfy its audience's preconceived notions. Everything about this film is fake. It's a veneer. Nothing about it is remotely genuine. That's why Disney had absolutely no problem integrating it into the hyper-reality of the theme parks. This is not what non-Western music sounds like. This is what Western audiences think non-Western music sounds like. It's like they didn't even bother to watch their own movie. Because the story behind this soundtrack is ironically familiar. I think that one of the most important things is to keep your ears open. Keep your ears open to unusual sounds, you know, things that you may find a little uncomfortable now. With a little bit of listening, some of those may become the favorite sounds in your musical world. Thanks for watching. I'd like to thank my patrons for making these videos possible with an extra special thank you to Alec Kulkowski, Alex Klinker, Clara Tan, Elise and Thomas, Google It, Hayden Elza, Jacob Salas, Jordan Adams, Karen Rosenau, Kate J, Kim Coletta, Myron John Tatarin, Noah Gray, Prelock, Rafael Martinez Salas, Rick Osborne, and Who Am I? I'd also like to thank everybody who requested that I talk about James Horner. I feel like this is sort of his unreleased greatest work. I would love to hear what those demos sound like, and I feel like this is an unappreciated effort that he made toward the film sport. If you like what you saw here, be sure to subscribe and check out my other videos. Follow me on Twitter and Twitch to have your musical questions answered live. And if you really like what I'm doing, then consider supporting the channel on Patreon. But that's all I got for now. Thanks for watching. So apparently there's a Pandora Research Foundation, which links to Pandoropedia, which as far as I can tell is like an officially licensed Disney database full of expanded avatar lore. And there is a whole page on this website on Navi music theory. And it says that they use pentatonic, diatonic, and microtonal scales. Okay.